my name is Tessa Nelson, and I am from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. We are so excited for tonight's event, the Phenomena of Growth with the Multiverse Concert Series. I am going to be your virtual host for the evening. If you would like captions for this evening's event, go ahead and click live transcript in the bottom right corner of your Zoom window to enable closed captioning. As you watch the presentation tonight, please feel free to share your comments in the chat. We will be watching the chat throughout the event, and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. If you're having technical issues, go ahead and put that problem in the chat as well, and our virtual technician will help as best they can. The Multiverse Concert Series is a nonprofit team of scientists, artists, and musicians combining immersive music, mind-bending art, and science into multimedia experiences. Tonight, they will be sharing an evening of music and science inspired by the fractal patterns of nature. Now, it, you will need a couple of things tonight. So if you haven't found them yet, go ahead and find mustard or mayonnaise or hand sanitizer, a flat plate, and a transparent drinking glass with a flat bottom. And we will use them throughout the night's event. And with that, let's turn it over to the Multiverse team from Boston. And everyone, enjoy the program.
<laughs> uh, we are performing here. Um, I say we're a live event series, but of course, with 2020, uh, we've switched uh, to stream. And now here we are as a hybrid. I don't know if you can tell I'm a hybrid. Um, we are performing to a, a Friends of Multiverse, small live audience, and of course, the uh, the Denver uh, community who've come out through the uh, Denver Museum of Nature and Science. We're thrilled to be here. Uh, that was uh, Dendritic, uh, collaboration between uh, Ermgard Bischoff Berger, who is our, our guest speaker uh, for tonight, um, and myself, uh, Jesse Christensen Cello, uh, and the Boston Museum of Science, who created that amazing uh, video um, out of Ermgard's research. And tonight's program is full of music, uh, visual art, uh, and uh, science and poetry, all about fluid dynamics. Uh, I'll be back to introduce things, uh, but without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, tonight's guest scientist, Dr. Ermgard Bishop Berger. Let's have a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you, David, and good evening, everyone. So I'm Arunga Bischofberger. I'm an assistant professor at MIT, and it's really a pleasure to be here tonight and to tell you about some of my lab's work. So a lot of what you're seeing tonight is work done by my graduate student, Ching Chang. She's here in the audience, and you'll see her, also the people in Denver, in just a minute. So wherever we look around us in the world, we see patterns that spontaneously merge. Patterns in plants, patterns in the ripples of sand, and even patterns that form inside of us. For example, the helical structure of DNA. So what my lab is trying to understand is how do such patterns spontaneously form? So how do these patterns spontaneously form? What governs their growth morphology? And can we ultimately learn how to tune and control pattern growth? And so the seemingly very different patterns that we see in nature have some common characteristics that they all share. For example, many pattern growing systems are characterized by the fact that tiny perturbations in the system can grow to very large scale patterns, where the growth is due to a competition between different forces in the system. And so I'd like to show you tonight two examples where we see some of these concepts that lead to the spontaneous formation of quite complex and really quite beautiful patterns. And so I'd like to start this evening by showing you a very simple experiment. But we have two glass plates that we place on top of each other and they are separated by a very thin gap. Into this gap, we inject through a center hole two fluids a first fluid, which we then displace by a second fluid. And so if I were to ask you what is going to happen in this experiment, you will probably tell me that most likely the second fluid is just going to displace the first one in the form of a circle or a disk. And so let me show you how that looks like. We here inject water into an oil. The oil is already in the cell. And as the video starts, we start to inject the water, which is going to displace this oil, probably uniformly. And so quite surprisingly, spontaneously, we get a very complex pattern that forms at the interface between these two fluids. And so such a so-called viscous fingering instability actually happens every time when a less viscous fluid displaces a more viscous one, where the viscosity of a fluid tells us something about how easily it can flow. So whenever a less viscous fluid such as water displaces a more viscous fluid such as oil or honey, we will see such instabilities to happen. And so if you look at the growth of these patterns, we see that finally we end up with fingers that all have a fairly uniform size. And so indeed, we can show that the size of these fingers depends on the surface tension between the two fluids, on the viscosity difference, and on the velocity of the interface. And so essentially, what this equation is telling us is that the growth of these fingers is set by the competition between the surface tension forces, which try to oppose the instability, and the viscous forces which drive the growth of the instability. And it is that competition which sets a length scale in the system, which is the length scale 
of the small perturbations that will grow into large scale structures. And so the growth occurs by repeated tip splitting of that structure. If you look into the red box and you follow one of the fingers, you see it at least four times how it splits and creates a new generation of branches. And so this type of growth leads to these very branch patterns, a fairly disordered type of growth. And what is truly remarkable is that we recover exactly these features of growth all over in nature. We see trees that branch and branch and branch at the tips. We see this type of growth in the human lungs on very different scales in river networks or in blood vessels. However, if you think about it, nature has many more tricks. Nature can also form very ordered patterns, which we call dendritic growth. And so examples of that are the snowflake, for example, with its six-fold symmetry, or some solidified alloys or copper oxides. And now we can also probe this more ordered growth with our exact same viscous fingering instability. What we need to do, though, is to somehow prevent this very ubiquitous tip splitting that leads to all these branches in order to get a stable tip that penetrates into the outer fluid. So the way to actually stabilize this tip splitting is by introducing anisotropy or a directionality to the growth, which we can do artificially by engraving an ordered lattice on one of our plates. This simple modification to the growth environment that makes that a system that usually will grow by this branching growth, to make it grow in this very ordered dendritic type of growth. Now, Ching has found out an even more elegant way to actually get dendritic structures in our instability, which is by instead of using anisotropy in the environment, using a liquid that by itself has a certain anisotropy. And the liquid we can use to do that is a liquid crystal, which is composed of rod-like molecules that can align all in the same direction. And I'll tell you more about these very fascinating fluids in my second talk. Here though, what allows us to get anisotropy into the system is the fact that the flow properties depend on the alignment or the flow direction. So it's easier to flow or the viscosity is lower in the direction which is aligned with the molecules rather than perpendicular to it. And so this gives us again a directionality to the growth, which allows us to see dendrit uh, dendritic patterns with non-tip splitting stable tips. And I guess you all remember these patterns from the first video from David's piece dendritic. And so in our lab, we can probe these transitions from branching to dendritic growth in order to identify the control parameters for the growth, which will allow us to gain control and predictive power over pattern formation in many different systems. So I think after hearing all of that, it's time for you both at home and here in the audience to do a pattern yourself. So for those of you at home, I hope you all had a chance. Hello again. So well, we've been having fun. Uh, we have some, some materials here. Um, so we'll just give you a minute to finish your, your patterns. Um, incredible. I, I actually have one of these that, um, that I made uh, years ago uh, that lives in my, in my study. Um, just one of the many um, incredible patterns that nature makes um, all around us, um, if you know where to look. Who has the best patterns? Uh, I wonder if people can put can can our online audience post pictures, perhaps on the uh, perhaps on the Denver Science Museum, Nature and Science Museum social media. You can put pictures of your patterns. But we're going to move on to our next piece in the program. If I'd like to invite, um, we have um, guitarist and composer Ryan Gillett. And he's going to tell us about his piece. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Ryan Gillette. And I have been working with David Ibbett for about a year and a half, two years now. Um, over the summer, I was introduced to the team. And I was intrigued by the 
moving liquid crystal structures through the fluid. So the piece I'm about to perform for you is called orthorhombic hydrology. And basically, orthorhombic is one of the shapes that a crystal structure can make. And then hydrology is another term for the study of water. So I hope you all enjoy. <laughs> Well, uh, this is a live show, uh, and the next element is almost live. Uh, it was recorded uh, this week, and it comes to us uh, from Poland. Uh, Marlena Boken Hewitt is a Polish uh, artist, science artist, uh, who's worked with Multiverse for some time, uh, and she uh, first got involved uh, to do uh, exoplanetary art uh, for our project Octave of Light. Uh, but she's since become involved in fluid dynamics and incredible possibilities uh, with visuals. And she's created this wonderful uh, workshop for us to see how you can take uh, the techniques that Ermgard's shown you and really take them to another level. So this is Marlena Buchan Hewitt. Good afternoon, Colorado. Hi, David. Hi, Ingard. My name is Marlena Bosian Hewitt, and I'm a visual artist who is fascinated with pattern language. Today, I will show you very quickly the project I have been working on based on Ingard's uh, research. Come. Here, I have created a pattern, very simple, very delicate, based on uh, Ingard's research, of course. This one is a little bit more complicated, more complex. And this is, goes just like that. And based on that, I have decided that I'm gonna create projects 
I'm gonna create portraits, right? So here, using the same language that uh, it was introduced here, I have created a portrait of Ingard. Self portrait. And today, I'm gonna create a portrait of David Ibbett. Ta-da! <laughs> Come, I show you how. What do we need? We need a picture. We need two pieces of glass. We need acrylic painting and brushes and water. I have the image and I place, I place my glass on the image. I can move the glass around to choose the, comp the right composition I want, right? Do I want the portrait, the um, person have be in the middle, on the side, this side? I decided that I want to have David on this side. Now I'm going to use the paint and I'm going to start with the lightest color. Paint over. Eyes in the middle. I kind of have to do it fast because I don't want the paint to dry. The paint uh, needs to be wet. And the more paint uh, we have, the better uh, patterns we will have. The water is not so good because the, when the water dries, it's it's we're just not gonna have the pattern. Mm, a little bit here. color brown the lighter hair here I'm gonna extend the the hair head here because it's cut off like this and now black so this is our oh no that's white handsome friend David more on the eyes and the lips here Now I need the second glass and I'm going to place this on top of this. But let me get rid of this image here. And look what's happening in the paint. And when I press the glass, the image is changing. We're destroying kind of the image that we carefully created. And now the most important part. This is the part where we're gonna get the, the beautiful patterns, like in here. I'm just gonna pull this glass apart. Ready? One, two, three. It's not easy. See? It's gorgeous. That's beautiful. Ta -da! So as you can see, the, the portrait is not realistic, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's more abstract. 
And these days, I don't think that many people want realistic portraits since we have cameras. So it's nice to create images that are a little bit different. And when the paint dries, you're gonna see more than fine patterns that you have in here. So as I mentioned on the beginning, the pattern that I was experimenting uh, on the very beginning of our friendship with Ingard and David were here and I used that in portraits. So this is a portrait of David. This is Ingard. This is me. And because this is take number three, that was David as well. <laughs> so we have few images of David just for our viewers in Colorado. Thank you so much. I hope I will see you soon. Bye bye. Destruction, uh, creation, uh, fractal branching. I'm it's it's quite a, a feeling for me. So I've been involved with Umgar's work for so many years now. Uh, to get the uh, the branching treatment, and plus you get two of them, so I can send one to my mum, uh, who's in England right now. Uh, perhaps she's watching. It's very late there. Okay, well, the next piece on the program uh, features uh, myself and Beth Sterling, uh, who is a singer for the evening, and it's called Water Romanza. Um, water is a recurring theme throughout um, much of science, and we originally made this piece about water on exoplanets and water spread throughout the universe. Perhaps it's dormant, perhaps it's teeming with life, uh, but of course water enables uh, so many of these patterns that we're looking at tonight. So we thought it was a good fit. Uh, this is a, an acoustic version of the piece, in case you've heard the electronic one. Water Romanza.
like to pass the floor back to our esteemed Dr. Bischof Berger, who will present the second part of the phenomena of growth, all about liquid crystals. Um, God. Thank you, David. All right, so in the second part, I would like to tell you a bit more about water and about liquid crystals. And so this is again work together with Ching Chang. So at school, you've probably learned that there's three common states of matter. There's solids, there's liquids, and there's gases. So solids are characterized by the fact that the molecules or atoms have a certain fixed positions and a fixed orientational order. On the other hand, liquids and gases have random positions and random orientations. Now, liquid crystals are materials that are somewhere between a liquid and a solid. And so these are typically rod-like molecules and at high enough temperature, they can still flow like a liquid and have random orientations and random positions. However, typically below a certain temperature, they will all align in a certain direction. So they will now have no more positional order, just so they can still flow like a liquid, but they now have orientational order, which is a characteristics of a solid. So these liquid crystals can flow like liquids, but have the elastic properties like solids, so they resist deformation. And so what makes these such fascinating materials is that they can deform in many different ways. So they can either deform by a twist like a splay like deformation where the molecules splay with respect to each other. They can twist with respect to each other or they can bend. And all of these different deformation modes, they cost different amount of energy. And what I'd like to show you tonight is quite remarkable structures can emerge because of these different deformations of these half liquids, half solids. But so you probably have heard the term liquid crystals in the context of liquid crystal displays. However, the liquid crystals that we want to study, they are a little bit different than those that you have in your uh, iPhone screens or laptop screens. And what makes them different is that they live in water. So these are aqueous liquid crystals where the molecules are dispersed in water. And this is very exciting because that makes them biocompatible, biocompatible materials, which might eventually be used in order, for example, to control assembly of biological systems or to guide the flow or the motion of bacteria. Before we can start doing that though, we have to understand what happens to them as they flow. And so we again start with simple experiments where we let them flow in a so-called microfluidic channel, a thin channel between two glass plates. And so naively, I would have expected that they would all simply align in the same direction as they flow, because that would lead to the lowest viscosity of the fluid. However, so if that were the case, then what we would see if you look at them under a polarizing microscope would just be a uniform blue image. However, again, nature has a couple surprises for us because as we look at these systems on the flow, what we see is that the spontaneous formation of stripe-like patterns. These stripes form over a fairly large region of our sample. And they are truly quite remarkable to observe. So Jing could show, using many different optical techniques, what actually corresponds to these stripes is a very complex alignment of the liquid crystal molecules. So we can show that at these black stripes, the liquid crystals align from the bottom to the plate to the top of the plate in a vertical orientation, whereas in between these black stripes, they align vertical to the flow. What this means is that overall, they build a twist-like structure in the flow direction. So spontaneously, they decide to form a really complex twist-like 
assembly. So this alone is pretty amazing, but it's only half of the story because there's also an alignment happening in between the two plates, which is also a twist-like deformation, but in an opposite direction. So if you now want to put all of this together, where we now represent the liquid crystal just by a dash, and the length of this dash denotes the orientation, we see this twist-like deformation in the flow direction, the twist-like deformation in the gap direction, which leads to this really fairly complex double periodic twist structure, which leads to the appearance of these stripes. And so these stripes have a certain specific spacing between them. And if we go back to what I told you about in the very beginning, these different modes of deformation, we now see that we actually have two of them that happen in this structure. These liquid crystal molecules can twist, but they also bend, for example, at these red indicated regions. And it's again a competition between different forces in the system. In this case, a competition between how much does it cost the material to bend versus how much does it cost it to twist, which leads to this uh, periodic twist structure with a certain fairly well-defined distance between these stripes. And so I hope I could share some of the really quite amazing and often unfortunately hidden beauty that we can observe in fluid flows. Thank you very much. We're going to move on to uh, our next piece, which is um, a poem uh, by Ellen Rogers, uh, who's a poet based out of Minnesota. Uh, it's called Movements, and I was fortunate enough uh, to have her read it to me uh, some years ago. Um, the, the main subject of the poem um, is the life of uh, Jacqueline Dupre, uh, as you know, a famous cellist who has suffered from multiple sclerosis and gradually lost the ability to play uh, with her muscles, but continued to play uh, with her mind. And the poem deals with uh, the cello, uh, the body, um, the resonant waves of music, uh, science, uh, fluids, um, and really is the connecting thread uh, that brings together um, all the elements in this show. So this is Movements by Ellen Rogers. Movements. One, Adagio. The first lesson asks me to hold the cello well, to prop its top against my ribs, beneath my breast, and atop my breath. Knees I've scraped since I learned to walk should not knock or pinch or scrape against the cello's hips. Instead, my knees should steady the cello. My teacher says I will feel the ghost of the scroll, that tidal wave where strings tighten and get right, pull of the ocean at peak, at the nape of my neck. I am to practice holding the cello well without my arms. I am to extend my arms and wave them as if I am treading generous water. I am to feel the way my back becomes a part of my front, like the sides of me, neighbors reach over the fence offering sugar. I listen to Jacqueline Dupre play Edward Elgar's cello concerto in E minor. Dupre plays like she holds in her body every tide and flood, every phase of the moon, every hung cloud and churning storm. I don't know another way to say this. Her husband says music poured out of her as though from a source of nature. Two, lento. Sometimes I squeeze the cello's neck too hard. I don't notice that my left thumb aches until my teacher calls attention to its strain. Imagine your thumb rests on a grape and you don't want to pop the grape, my teacher says. I don't pop the grape. Make your arm a bird wing, she says. In my mind, I see a crow above the cedars riding thermals, gliding high and higher. I see the crow flap. I imagine I am a crow and I draw the bow out and in again. My arms are wings, and that is right. Some students, she tells me, think they need to know the exact name of the muscle to engage. They want technical direction. But for me, learning the cello requires magical thinking. I tell my writing students that poets have the power to say something 
is something else. To transform and equate the world. This sentence, I am a poet, voila. This sentence, my arm is a bird wing. I imagine poets stitching the world together, long silver threads of text, lines prompting reading, dreaming minds, not to see everything by itself and separate, but to see the seams often unseen in the dark expanses across space and time. This is perhaps a power not to wield, but to hold, to practice holding. Three, Adagio. When my brother and I lived together as adults, we went to the mountains each year for his birthday. One year, the sun warded off all clouds with its low autumn sweep. We could see peaks and valleys cradling us. The cascades that breathe ocean matched the blue-green sound. On his next birthday, we walked the same trail but couldn't see any peaks at all, not even the peak we aimed to crest. Wind wiped and wiped at infinite fog. Clouds clung to us, dampening us. Comacultion, the great watcher, should have been right in front of us, but we wandered without a long view and without landmarks. I am used to seeing something one day and not seeing it the next. Something can make me forget that a mountain watches over the bowl of land in which we dwell all the way to the blue well of the bay. Something can make me blue and listless. There are people that face hardship and imagine moving beyond it. I can't always imagine that. Sometimes the rain obscures. My mind says stop and means you are not a bird. You are not a cellist. You are not a poet. Turn back. Four, Allegro. At 28, Dupre could no longer feel the weight of her bow. She could not hold her cello well. When the doctors told Dupre, you have multiple sclerosis, I imagine they meant your body will attack its own nerves. Your nerves will scar and falter and mute. Your position sense will diminish. Imagined motion in your mind will no longer speak to your body. What they meant was, you will not imagine movement into music. You cannot be a cellist. The mind and the body do not always match. I am learning how to move my left hand over the unmarked landscape of strings. One night, my hand drifts just right on the first try, I trust my arm and resound the note again and again, amazed that my body remembers where to place my hands. Something born from and beyond the body survives us. When I watch clips of Dupre, my motor neurons prime. I study her bowing arm and my arm lifts as if I am a marionette strung to a flock of birds, as if I am strung to her. I breathe when she breathes. My body tries to match her body. All day, Dupre plays Elgar in my mind. She moves me. Seven years after her diagnosis, Dupre said, the music is still alive in my head. I imagine she did not mean I am no longer a cellist. I imagine she meant what I imagine remains. From my open string, a long tone sounds. When I say a long tone sounds, I mean imperceptible molecules move to touch. These silver strings bind everything together. These unbound waves resound old tones bowed by those before us. Their meeting makes them known as this note. So we're moving into our final piece. Uh, It's a live piece here. And we're going to bring back Beth Sterling, vocalist and Min Jin Chung cellos. Uh, so I'll take a moment now, I think, to thank a lot of people. Uh, so we are hosted by the Denver Museum of Nature and Science uh, for the stream, uh, but we're performing live from Mind Mics uh, in Cambridge, who are a, a company building headphones uh, that monitor your body and the music of your mind and inform you about your health and your cardiovascular health. And uh, they've generously given us this space to perform and support Multiverse in many ways. So uh, the last piece on our program uh, is called Unbound Waves. And you might remember that's from the very end of Ellen Rogers' poem. 
Um, and it's in, it's inspired uh, so much by um, that poem. I, I steal a few lines. Don't worry, she gave me permission. I steal a few lines. Uh, but the other lyrics are pretty much all from lectures that I've listened to from um, God Bischof Berger over the years. I find the language of science to be so musical, uh, and especially the way that she brings such whimsy uh, to the, the study of our world um, filled me with music and I've been I'm always looking for ways to get it out uh, so that's what this piece is about um, originally I was going to take some actual data uh, and sonify uh, to produce the rhythms and I I don't know if you if you've heard some of my uh, other pieces I, I like to use computers uh, to produce um, sort of data-driven music uh, but in the end something about the um, the lyricism uh, of, of the voice um, made me want to write this acoustic piece for, for cello and voice, and I'll be on the piano. Uh, but you'll have to uh, take my word uh, uh, for the fact that the melodies in the verse are taken from these liquid crystal waves, which is order coming from chaos, uh, order that gradually establishes itself uh, into a rhythm and then dissipates uh, again and again. Um, so here is Unbound Wave.
That's our show. <laughs> well, we're out of breath here in Boston, and we hope you were able to uh, join us. I'm sorry about the technical difficulty earlier, but I have a lot of people to thank. Uh, well, we'll go with Beth Sterling, our vocalist. Uh, Min Jin Chung, cellist. Earlier in the program, we had Ryan Jule, guitarist, making it all happen behind the scenes. Is Vince Leroy on the uh, sound desk. See, I know I'm going to forget someone, so please shout out if I do. Uh, we are hosted by the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. We made this event possible. Uh, and our live uh, Friends of Multiverse audiences here in Mind Mics uh, in Cambridge. Uh, a round of applause for both Denver Museum and Mind Mics for making this happen. I'm David Ibbett and I direct Multiverse Concert Series. Uh, we're starting our new season. This was the first event of our new season. Please visit multiverseseries.org to see what we're doing. Uh, we're about to do a Kickstarter for our new album, Black Hole Symphony. And doesn't that sound cool? Uh, <laughs> join us for that one. We're doing live and streaming programming uh, and we want to meet you. So please let us know what you thought. And I'll pass back over to the Denver Museum. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. That was absolutely wonderful. It's always so inspiring to see scientists affected by art and presenting it with artistic expression. I think I speak for everyone here in Denver when I say bravo. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, you can find out more about Multiverse in the link that I'm putting in the chat. And if you want to learn more about patterns in nature, I'm sorry, we didn't get to all of your questions. The Denver Museum of Nature and Science is hosting the temporary exhibit Numbers in Nature, a Mirror Maze through September 19th. And you can find more information about that with the link that I've put in the chat as well. So thank you all so much for joining us tonight and have a great evening.